So, Maddie, um, I'm super stoked to have you on. I feel like I have been watching your career for so long because I feel like we probably started weightlifting at the same time. I started in 2013. That's like right before me. Okay. Well, I, I guess I was lifting. I wasn't competing yet at that point. Yeah. So that, so I basically, I started CrossFit. So I started snatching and clean and jerking in 2013. So it's been really cool for me personally, because like, I feel like a hipster in saying this, but it's like, I've been there the whole time. I've been watching the whole time. So I'm really happy. It's kind of like full circle to get you on this podcast. I'm really happy you're here. A whole decade later. Yeah. So, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is I, I I watched some content a while back and it was kind of, I think it might've been a flow documentary. Um, Way back. Yeah. And it was, a, it was really cool. Um, and one of the things that you had talked about was like this dream of the Olympics. And I just want, kind of want you to talk about that Olympic dream because I thought it was really compelling. And then um, obviously you, you weren't able to make it to Rio, which I'm sure was heartbreaking. Uh, but then you finally made it, you, you got to, uh, Tokyo and, um, I know you're going for Paris. So talk to me about that, where, it, where it started, you know, um, to where you are now. So I basically out of the womb was a gymnast. Um, I have an older sister and that's kind of just like, you just shove your child in diapers into a, a gymnastics gym and you're like, just go do something. So I was there while my sister was in that phase. Um, and I guess I liked it. Obviously, I don't remember any of this, but um, I started like training when I was one and a half or two. Um, and then with that, I feel like maybe with every sport, but gymnastics especially, you're like put on this path is either you're going to be a collegiate gymnast or you're going for the Olympics. Like that's it. If you're serious about it, like those are your two paths. It's never just like, oh, I'm going to do this for fun because elite gymnastics is not very fun at all. Um, so from the time I was, I don't know, probably five or six, I was like, I want to go to the Olympics. I remember watching, must have been maybe the 2000 or 2004 Olympics. And I was like mm -hmm. naming all my teddy bears after the gymnasts. Like I was, that was my plan. Um, but then I grew tall very quick. Uh, and I remember I was about 11 and one of my coaches went to my mom and was like, hey, you might want to find her like a different sport. And of course, like you ignore that when you're a kid. You're like, no, I'm going to do this one. Um, but I was training six days a week, five hours a day at that time, quit by the time I was 13 because I was just burnt out, tired. And at that point, I was like, well, shit, I don't know what to do. Like I knew I wanted to do some sort of elite sport, but I didn't have any other abilities that I knew of. So then I kind of like dabbled in everything that I could through school. Um, I did track, volleyball, wrestling. Um, I didn't really do any weightlifting till I had already found CrossFit. Um, and then I did some competitive cheerleading. And then from there, I found weightlifting. And that was like the first time where I was like, oh, I like this. Like this, this gives me that same feeling that gymnastics did where like, I think if I try really, really hard, like maybe I can be good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it being an individual sport definitely gave me some of that too. Um, but basically from my first junior nationals on, I was like, all right, like, I don't know if it's realistic, but I would like to try to go to the Olympics. So that was 2014. Yeah. And then obviously yeah. 2016, a big old bummer. Um, but I sat in the stands, I watched. I hated every second of it. I was miserable the whole time. But that, I guess, kind of fueled it. Like, I don't ever want to sit and watch the Olympics ever again while I'm, yeah. like, a competitive athlete. Like, I do not ever want to feel these things or go through this experience again. And that was definitely fuel for 2020 when I did finally make it. Yes. Talk to me more about that that process of selection in 2016, because I don't think many people know what was the issue uh, and, and why you weren't selected. So for 2016, every quad, the selection procedures change, as I think most people know. Yeah, um, it's kind of weird. It's actually yes. really convoluted. <laughs> yes, it's terrible. Um, so 2016, the process was you had we had three spots. Um, at that time, you had to earn points uh, by placement at Worlds for the team as a whole. And that's how many spots um, you were like allotted. And 
So going into the Olympic trials, I was ranked in the top two. So well into the top three. However, the third spot for US, this is USAW procedures, was allocated to the person who had, I think who had earned the most points for the team. So the previous two world championships, which would be 2014 and 2015, Right. Those two appearances combined would give you like your points and whoever had the most points, that's how you would be given a spot separate of the top three ranking. And so since I started in 2014, I didn't even go to 2014 worlds, obviously. So I only had 2015 worlds to count towards that. So that was out of the question. So then at the Olympic trials, basically you had to finish top two. Um, and Among that's, all of the athletes, yes, not just yes. in your weight class, because you Correct. won that pretty easily, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that was the case for pretty much everyone that was in like the top five or six. Like you weren't really competing against the people in your weight class at that point. It yeah. was more just like they're, the top one of every weight class was in that like top 10 mix. Right. Um, so I finished, I got bumped down from second to third at the end of Olympic trials. Um, we put on what I needed for my last clean and jerk, which was, I mean, we knew that was going to be the case. We did not expect for it to be like, I think it was like a seven or eight kilo American record. It would have been, it was like some outlandish number for the time. Right. Nowadays, it's, it's not (laughs) that big of a deal. Um, but for the time it it was a big lift and I clerked it and that was it. That was the end. So that's, it's an interesting thing. Like, okay, the the U.S. has only allotted three spots to go to the Olympics in this sport. Whereas if you look at swimming and if you look at track and field and gymnastics, we, we are given all the spots to, to send athletes. Um, naturally, it would seem that like, okay, you won your weight class, you go to the Olympics. But that's not the case for us because of, you know, performances on, on the world scale, which really kind of sucks. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it was cool as hell to see you back, uh, to see you in the Olympics after 2016. Um, and I know you're going to make it for, for 2024. And it, the coolest thing about it is like, yeah, knock on wood. The coolest <laughs> thing is though, like, because of the delay, like 2024 is not far away. No. Like you don't have to deal with the whole quad again. And actually this was not a quad. It was a quint. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you, how how awful was it to deal with yet another year of training? For me, it wasn't like detrimental. If anything, I got stronger in that year because I had like that much more time to get used to being a little bit heavier. Because mm-hmm. um, that like you just feel different. You lift different. You move different. Everything's different. So like it was almost probably. I don't want to say beneficial. I, I wouldn't go that no, far, that, but it that's wasn't okay. bad. I mean, well, I, the only reason I'm saying is because I know I, I've talked to Dave Spitz and he said that Wes like absolutely died in that year. Like it was, you train your, this quad knowing you're going to go uh, and then you make it and you peak and you get everything right. And then it's like, okay, now we have to delay it a year. And for a guy like Wes with the weights like that and in where he was at training, because he has to cut to get to his class. like. Right. That was brutal. But for you, you kept growing into your weight class and it ended up working out. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people, well, no, all of us were on the mindset of like, all right, let's just make it to the Olympics. Let's make it to August, 2020. We can take a break. Like you just have to survive that long. And then when you get to like, I don't remember when they announced it, maybe like April, March or April. And then we're like, fuck, like we have to last not just three more months, like a year and three more months. So I think that was a hard thing for all of us to swallow. And then it was just the same as everybody that was stuck in quarantine. And it's like that just period of existence sucked for everybody. Right. So like it's going through that, figuring out how to train through that for those of us who were like in gyms at that time. So there was like so many factors that made that just like extra challenging as opposed to if it were just like, oh yeah, just one more year, like for fun or whatever. But did you didn't you have like the super dialed home gym at that point? Or no, no. you were you were going out to to Oregon, correct? Or uh, no. So at the time, I was training out of a gym uh, in Orlando. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So I was allowed to come in secretly like one or two times a week. They gave me a key, which was really cool. Um, so I would basically go in on my two a days and just 
spend the whole day there. Like I would do my two days in one like six hour long session wow. and just get as much as I could out of the gym itself because I didn't have blocks at home. At that point, it was just like a one car garage that I had and it was at a slope. So like not great. And I couldn't drop weights at home either because my neighbors complained. So that was pre what I have now. Wow. That is wild. I did I not know that I feel like that, that was like the case for everybody though. Like, yeah, we but like you're, you know, you're an, you're an elite Olympic athlete, like, and you have to deal with neighbors <laughs> complaining. Like that's just, that's, that's wild to think about. Um, I want to talk about, like, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to social media and your presence on it. I, I talked to Seb actually today, um, Seb Ostrovitz, who I'm sure you know, from uh, Weightlifting House. And he was saying like, you know, and, and we, we both agreed on this, like Maddie's probably currently, you are currently the most influential person in weightlifting, uh, in Olympic weightlifting. And that's a wild thing to think about. It's not because when we, when we think about influence, it's not just, you know, um, performance base, which obviously you have all the metrics for, but it's the, the breadth of which you can reach outside of Olympic weightlifting, which is something that I try to do on my channel and my podcast channel. Like I just had, uh, mutual friend, Johnny Frank on, which was, which was awesome by the way. <laughs> um, but I want like, how has that been for you? Like, I'll say from from my perspective, I see a lot of people, particularly women, who who don't really care about the sport of Olympic weightlifting. Like they couldn't name any weightlifters outside of the U.S. Um, or just outside of Maddie Rogers. Yet they're still weightlifters themselves. They like to snatch clean and jerk, but they're just more interested in you. How has this whole process been for you? Like being this influential? I. I mean, it was definitely never intended, <laughs> that's for sure. It was not something that I like actively tried to do or even really wanted. Like, I feel like my personality is not one of like, ooh, like, look at me, watch me. Like, I hate that. It makes me so uncomfortable. Um, so it's just something that kind of happened. And it doesn't like it doesn't feel like any different than like anybody else. Like, I don't feel influential, I don't feel whatever. The only time I really notice it, if I, if I like, I'm about to post something that's like, not great. I'm like, mm, should I filter this? Should I like not say fuck eight times in this paragraph? Maybe. But that's the only time I even really like notice it. Um, I don't know. It's such a weird thing to think about. Like, I don't think like my brain can like process that. No, I, I, and I, like having seen you interact at meets and with other people, like I can absolutely attest to that. You don't. You, you don't have this air about you that's like that. And it's pretty cool. It's it's pretty admirable. One of the things, too, is like you don't you're not going to post like on your Instagram. You're not going to search for like the most viral audio or like the most viral. You're just going to play the songs you like, which are a lot of times could be metal or deathcore or things like that, that yeah. like I find are pretty rad. But you mix all those things in. And, and I think. What's cool is like, and and this is something that people in the influencer world are going to look at and be like super jealous of you, is that you've kind of separated yourself and you still have success. You know, you're not, uh, it's not necessarily going against the grain, but it's not just following what um, everyone else is doing. Yeah. I think part of that is because I grew my following like pre this like content creator era where like mm -hmm. you have to like put work and dollars and like follow all the trending stuff in order to grow a following like my following has more or less been the same the last few years and it was like larger before that so like all of these things that people do that are like starting from scratch now in 2022 23 like I would never even consider doing any of those things like I like fuck a viral sound all of those songs are terrible for the most part and like I don't know. It's just, I, I definitely like people have asked, like, can you teach me like how to grow a following? I'm like, I don't fucking know. I, yeah. I if I gave you my recipe, it would not work. I literally no. do not know. Yeah. So that I have this kind of this theory and I can break down on a smaller scale. Like when I was competing in weightlifting, I knew there was a, there was a point at which I would continually focus on on training more and doing more in the gym. 
and my social media output would go down and, and my prevalence would go down. And I think that naturally as an athlete, like that's how it has to be. But if you are good enough as an athlete, uh, you will gain social media as well. Like, so I think that that's where you're at. So it's like, um, maybe at one point you would have been like, man, you know, I could stop like training really hard and make a ton of money doing what I love. And that is showing off weightlifting, showing off my, who I am showing all these things, but you were able to kind of not do that and still gain success. Um, the coolest part about that is that you put, like I said, you put on your own little flair to it. Like you didn't just do a viral sound, right? Like you, you were able to be yourself and excel at weightlifting. And I think that's, that's like the biggest balance that you hit on the head. One thing, one thing that Seb said was like that you walked into the world's gym and there's no way you noticed this in the training hall at world's. Um, and he said like a lot of other athletes were like looking at you and wanted to take pictures with you. What was that like? I feel like at Worlds, that's the one place where like that doesn't happen as much. Cause like, I mean, again, maybe I don't notice it cause I'm like starstruck by like Vasha in this corner and then Toma over here. And then the entire Chinese team, like right behind me, like that's what I'm, I'm like forgetting how to breathe because I'm in their presence. So like, I don't really notice a bunch, but like Worlds, and I know I have like a little bit of imposter syndrome here, but like I walk into worlds and I feel like, like silly. Like why, why, why do people follow me on social media versus all of these people that are so much better, like number wise, technique wise, they're just a better athlete. And like, I feel like, like they kind of look at me like, oh, like she's a poser almost. Like she's not a real weightlifter. She's an influencer. And like, I know that's not accurate, but that's like, that's what I feel. In a, in a world's training hall specifically. Yeah, and that's just too bad, man, because it's not the case at all. And I think, well, look, if you put yourself on the internet, you are bound to have imposter syndrome no matter right. what. And I believe in the fake it till you make it thing and like the placebo effect of that. Like, holy shit, I'm just going to throw myself. I've been in situations like, dude, I, I I went and trained with Bring Me the Horizon. And it, and it was like, I, I was like <laughs> in there, I'm like, totally acting like I'm a part. Yeah. Yeah. Of course I'm training with, you know, but in, in the back of my head, I'm like, who the fuck am I to be doing this? You know what I mean? Like I didn't have an agent set me up with these guys, but yeah. you do have to just jump in and be like, yeah, sure. Like I really like the idea of like, not necessarily talking yourself down from the imposter syndrome shit, but like just being like acting like you're supposed to be there. Yeah. You, you know, and it ends up working out too. Like, You've PR'd at World Meets, correct? Or or, or, or international meets. <laughs> you PR'd. Yeah, yeah, so then f fucking of course you're supposed to be there, you know? It's a it's a pretty cool thing. I w um so look, I I on on my channel I talk a lot about uh steroid use and the the reason I talk the and the way that I talk about it, I try to bring as much nuance into the discussion as I possibly can. And the the reason I can do that is because I look at comments and I know, I know what people are going to say. I know what they're going to say every single time. But I think that people, because they don't have skin in the game, they're simply just viewing it, that they can just get away with just saying, ah, screw it. I don't, you know, let them take drugs or whatever. When like in reality, there are people out there, AKA you and others who are directly affected by this. Um, one thing I can say, like, and this is objectively true, okay? And I, I, I believe that when people do wrong things and they, you know, they serve the time, you know, we have to move on with our lives. But you mentioned Laura Donatoma. She uh, had, she was tested positive for Winstrol uh, back in 2015 or 2014. Now, uh, that was as a junior and she's only gotten stronger since then. Lasha Talhadze, he was popped as a junior. He's only gotten stronger since then. Uh, Lu Zhaojun was just popped. He probably will never be back. The list goes on and on. This is the this is the way things are in this sport, and it's very difficult to parse through this without sounding like, oh, Americans don't do any drugs or we're better than everyone else. But 
the reality is like you saw a, a tough thing to deal with like and uh yeah. it, it's very real and it's very like it's just not a realistic thing to think about taking drugs what is your perspective on all of that i know i didn't i didn't really give you much to work with but <laughs> i i do want to open up this discussion with you yeah so it's funny because I just did an interview for uh, the Final Attempt documentary and they took a little snippet of our uh, drug use conversation and made that like a weightlifting house video. And I got shit on in those comments. People were so mad that I was like, just, I, I felt like my opinion of it, I was just telling it like it is, like people are on drugs. What did way. you say? What did you say? I basically... We are discussing like um, the totals on the start list and how this world, the totals were so high across the board. And we are discussing like, are they inflated totals? Is it because it's the first qualification? Is it because all of these countries just came off their ban? Like what's, what do we think the reason was? Um, and I had said like a lot of the countries that do have these massive, massive totals are people that have A, already served a sanction are just this is their first international meet back from a sanction um and basically the yes majority of the people took that as me like basically bitching about like them being better than me which is not what i'm saying i i did not mean that in any way and i even said like if they're not on drugs fucking good for them shit for me but good for them um but i I feel like it's so hard to get your point across in this like topic as an athlete without it coming off as bitching or complaining or like making excuses as I think, to, like why you're not that good. So I I think Maddie like I know exactly where you're going. I, I I at this point I feel like I'm an expert in this discussion because I'm I continuously I, I continuously give um, disclaimers to what I'm about to say. Yeah. And the only thing that you can, all, all you can do is give objective fact and then some level of speculation that you hope is incorrect. So right. here's, here is a fact. USADA and USA Weightlifting makes it incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult to uh, get away with steroid use. That's objective fact. And if you can, and if you are like, I don't know. You're likely going to get caught, but there isn't this government protection. Okay. So yeah. the, the idea that, so, so for instance, in, in a lot of countries, their internal governing agency would never say that they have tested positive. They would likely never do that. Okay. Because why, why would you go uh, like it's, it's for your team. Why would you want to pop your team? USADA and USA weightlifting Oh, do not give a single fuck about protecting someone if they've pissed positive. That right there is a massive discrepancy. And I, I, I don't understand how someone could argue against that. So the, this, the next one is, again, we talk and I, look, this is somebody who people are going to be incredibly emotionally attached to, but they must know that Laura Donna Toma has been caught using a very heavy compound of steroids. This is called stenozolol. It's not just, you know, like a low dose of whatever it is. She was caught. She had it. She only got stronger over the next half decade. Okay. Right. We can't just sit back and say that nothing's awry and that like these totals increasing are just because of system and methodology. So it is it's okay to speculate that, but notice how I just had to deliver all of that shit. <laughs> right. Right? right? Where where you can't just sit there and be like, "Look, these countries are likely still taking drugs. It's hard for me to fucking take drugs. That's bullshit." Right. And oh, well, I think that's why so many like US athletes specifically will kind of just like glaze over the topic. Like they don't want to get into it because there's no good way to say any of it because the, and the other argument is, well, you've meddled at worlds. So you're saying that these people that are on the top of the podium are using drugs and you're also on that podium. So you're using drugs. I'm like, no, but I don't really have a good argument as to how that's possible. Like I'm, I'm not some like genetic monster here. Like I'm just an athlete, just like the rest of them. But like, no. No, I, I have a, explain it. 
Oh, no, I, I like look. I ha- I have a I have actually a, a tremendous argument against that. There's uh, there are many instances of countries being completely sanctioned out of world. So the first worlds that you mem- meddled at, there were countries that were not allowed to participate. Right. Okay. That that is a fact. We had the the most medals in like forty years at worlds uh, in that senior worlds because and I'm it sucks to say it, but because many countries were not allowed to compete based yeah. off the back of like one of the biggest sanctioning quads in history okay um beyond that in women's weightlifting particularly it is a very pointed like there are actually not that many big women's programs currently and there haven't been because it's a later developed sport if we look at the men's side the men's side specifically it is impossible to be on the podium, not sorry, I don't want to say impossible because we've done it, but it is much less likely to be on the podium uh, if you are not taking drugs. Yeah. But we, what we can see is the development of these programs on the women's side. I think there are some teams, I'm not going to speculate right now, that are currently on the rise that we saw at Worlds that were just like going crazy and going off. Um, but I think like it's not, here's how I, and I'm sorry to rant. No, way, I love because, this rant. Okay, I'm in for so, this. Um, b- by the way, like what I what I can see is like if the natural lifter is in a the right weight class at the right time, and they have a PR meet or a five for six meet or both basically. Sometimes you can have a PR total and go five for six. Sometimes you can have a PR total and go four for six. Right. But let's just say you have a PR meet. And let's say the top three or four lifters, like you just have, it's a weird meet. People are just missing lifts. And I'm sure you've been to world meets where you're like, whoa, shit, this person's missing. Like what, what is that all about? Okay. So now you have an opening to get third or second, maybe first in one of the events, but it's still unlikely that you're going to win a total gold. Yeah. That's where I see the natural lifter actually stepping up when the entirety of the the totals are down lower. Now, yeah. when people ramp the fuck up for worlds, they have to almost bomb out for a natural lifter to 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 medal. That's yeah. my thesis or at least. And that's um, how I felt this worlds was. Like this was one of those like balls to the wall, everybody's here, everybody's like in shape. That's what I felt this last worlds was. Whereas like 2021 worlds for example, like who's there? Nobody. Yeah, that's the post Olympic worlds that yeah 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 I mean, that the world's to win <laughs> but i didn't right right well i look i i again this it sucks no people are very emotional i'll tell you this right now maddie the the all those comments on the weightlifting house video like i know it's gonna be i i just need you to ignore them i really do because if you sat down in a room with them and you were able to explain this and talk with those people face to face there's no way they would treat you like that there's not a way in hell they would treat you like that but but you're not and you're never going to so it's like i know what you mean and i know what you feel i want to tell you right now that like i know exactly what you're trying to say and i've it's because i've been trying to fucking say it for so goddamn long Um, and I I just, I think it's just an important thing to talk about. I agree. I mean, here's like a great example at this, this past worlds a month ago, I was taking a pre-workout that I think I'd only been tested on like maybe once. It wasn't one of the like informed choice ones. And they like harp on us. Uh, USAW does like, do not take anything that's not like third party tested. It's either drug free sport or informed choice. Like they need to get this fucking like $30,000 $30,000 certification just to have a little sticker on Yeah, there. the NSF. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, and I was taking one that didn't have that. And I I don't even remember how it came about. I was just like talking about it. I was like, oh, I'm going to go buy some sparkling water for my pre-workout or whatever. And Amy, my coach, was like, what, like, what pre-workout are you taking? And then from there, like I was not allowed to touch it, sniff it, lick it, a- ingest it in any way because we were like, what what if this pre-workout that's totally fine it's not some like insane clown whatever it was just like caffeine but we were so afraid to even put that in my body because i hadn't couldn't remember if i had been tested on it or not yet just in case like it something it was tainted with something like that's how like fucking religious we are about Anything that we put in our body that's not even a drug. It's just like, oh, maybe this caffeine might have a little something in it. And we're like terrified. 
Yeah, I I don't know. Like, people, th- look, I'll tell you right now. This is the the other side on the internet. Everyone is on drugs, so let them all be on drugs. Right. Uh, doping and anti doping, or sorry, anti doping is stupid. Yeah. Um, and that's just a frustration that people have. It is like people don't. What they want to do is just enjoy something and not think about the bad thing or whatever it may right. be. They don't want to be confused. They don't want to think about nuance and and what they're thinking. Because look, Lord Onatoma snatches one nineteen in the fucking training hall. I'll everyone's watch gonna it every day. Yeah, I love ev- to see it. And yeah, and everyone's gonna be like, "Wow, that was really fucking cool." Let me go on an Instagram. Holy shit, this chick is super fucking cool. Now I go, hey, just so we're clear, she broke the rules and she's probably continuing to break the rules. Um, everyone's gonna be like, fuck you, like yeah. boo, fuck you, right? But I just said a fact. Right. That that was that was a fact. I don't know what else to tell you. And right. so the position that you're in is the same position that myself, Seb from Weightlifting House, we're all in the same one. Like we we have to sometimes open this thing up and and tell people how the sausage is made, so to speak. But I don't think people have the investment that we do. I know they don't. I know they don't. Um, and, and especially for you in in particular, I oh man, it is a it is a rough thing. I just I have to show you this book. <laughs> this book, Faust Scold. Uh-huh. Have you ever heard of it? Uh uh-uh. uh Dude, you gotta read this. Okay. Um, it's super super easy. I don't know if you read many books or whatever, but okay. murder mysteries. But I read. <laughs> okay, but this one's great. It's uh, about the inside uh, germ. It's. It, Inside the East German doping machine, oh, and the love things that, that already. the things that they did to these women uh, in particular are horrific, and it was all state sanctioned doping. So it was like, no. um, sorry, I just totally spaced out no, there, it's, but it's totally fine. But it's it's something that I'm very very interested in, and I see the other side, and I feel I feel for you, right? I've I've asked Wes Kitts the same thing, and he just is kind of like, look, I know that I can get better. Yeah. And, and that's all he says, you know, and that's kind of it kind of sucks because it's like I you're mean, never allowed to talk about it to an extent. Like I, I understand the argument that everybody has. It's like I just want to watch him lift weights like I want a human science experiment, pump them full as much as much shit as their body can take and let them lift as much weight as the human body physically can. Like I see that that's entertaining. That's fun to watch if it doesn't affect you in any way. And like I get why you wouldn't want these like bossed up big names to like go away. It's not fun to watch anymore. But like, I don't, it's so no, but, hard but to like. L- look, let's just say it how it is. You're the product of that. You will not get, it won't be fair for you. No, it won't be. But like then, but the, like I, I'm fucking number one Lasha fan in the stands like screaming for him. So like, it's hard to like preach that and be like, like clean sport. Everyone needs to be clean, whatever, whatever. But like, I'm just as excited watching these people, but at the same time, they are the ones that are taking away Olympic spots from everyone because of their sanctions, specifically taking up the few spots that we do have and then making it harder for us to meddle. So like all of it sucks. It's all terrible. And I just like, I don't know. And I think like, I'm never, ever, ever going to convince every person that I'm clean. There's always going to be people, even my fucking husband, when we started dating, he was like, uh, into powerlifting and like the first time he took me to his gym all of them were like natural girls don't have traps like that and like they were like just at they're like what's her stack and he's like dude i don't know yet i haven't figured it out and like he's told me he thought i was on drugs for like the first few months we were dating and i was like you live with me now like <laughs> there's you can see everything there is to see but yeah, like so my uh, uh my ex was an olympic swimmer and um she's from France, but WADA would show up at our door. But like, I think it was just via USADA or something. I don't know. Would show up at our door. Uh, and one time they showed up twice in 24 hours. One time they showed up the day after Christmas or something. It was, it was ridiculous. Some of the days that they showed up. Uh, and I was just like, like <laughs> she's just not on drugs, like flat out, not on drugs. And she was an Olympic finalist in swimming. Right. And so, so for people to say like, just put a blanket statement statement over everyone's on drugs or like there it's all corruption. Well, it's, it's actually, no, it's not, it's not. And, and like 
to for, for people to point out like, hey, look, it's not easy for us to use drugs. It is easier for them to use drugs. Like wow. it should be that simple. It should be that simple to be able to say that statement and like watch someone argue. I think one of the things that was true that I would say with um with uh that that Max and I have talked because Max and I have talked like endlessly. Max Ada. Oh, he's a good one to talk to about. Yeah, we've talked endlessly about this. Like <laughs> when it, we had the same point that you did, the the one side of the mouth being like, I love Lasha and I love watching it, and then the other side of the mouth being like, Hey, just so we're clear, he was popped with Stanozla, like just so everyone knows that. Yeah. Um we we've said the same thing at this year's world in Colombia. So like there's the basic like protocol procedure that everyone every every testing agency should know. Colombia, the toilet that you pee over in whatever was a porta potty in the dark that was broken. You had to like reach your arm down and around. And like the rule is, you're supposed to have your shirt like above your belly button and your pants below your knees. And the drug tester is supposed to squat to be able to physically see the urine leaving your body. This was a porta potty with no light, nowhere to wash your hands. It was broken. I had to hide the urine coming out of my body just to be able to get it into like the little cup. And like, if that were in America, that would never be the case. Like never, ever, ever. Like, yeah. So that was the, that was the WADA testing protocol. Yeah. That, right? I don't know. I don't remember who the testing okay. agency was that actually what, did it. It's the ITA but. that that they hire, the quote unquote ITA, yeah. International Testing Agency. That's who want to. But like, do, okay, so now like Columbia as a team, like, are they going to fucking get the same testers? Are they going to do the same shit? Like, no, they're not. It's exactly. not going to happen. I don't know how, like, that's why it was so insane to see Lu Zhaozhen be popped. It was. Yeah mind blow like that it is way bigger news than people need like to you know and because everyone goes how, how often do any chinese lifters get popped at never. all never never one time lao wei was popped or something for some like really weird thing it was a total mistake on the chinese behalf like you know and notice how i'm saying mistake because like it's just an assumption that they're doing things to circumvent testing uh, and to mask and all of these, and it's things. never their like top players either. It's it's some like kind of like B team well, ish person, yeah. and yeah. then there's like the occasional one every like I don't know almost decade. Yeah, uh, I I I mean we could talk endlessly about this, and I think I I just want like I want people I I want people to know clearly, right, that it's not some sort of and I, I don't they're they're always going to say, okay, well Maddie just thinks this is just so unfair. Uh and like <laughs> like I, I know you know you can do better, right? Right. That's always when you finish a meet, you don't simply go, I uh, you know, like it's because I wasn't on drugs. Like you'll finish a meet and you'll be like, I could have been better here, here, and here, correct? Yep. And yeah, and and I think though you know, you, you continually do that, but there needs to be a point at which you can point to other athletes. Like there needs to be some point where you can say something without getting ab absolutely attacked online for it. Right. I think part of it also is like, if you're not like passionately, like angry, like I want to fucking fight these people, like they don't think you care or they think that you're also on drugs, but it's like, that's just the world that we live in. And being that upset and enraged about it is not going to help me do any better. It's not going to help me walk into a session where nine out of 10 of them are on drugs and feel like I could hang with them. Like, Look, I, I, I actually want to ask you this. If I was to, if I sent a USADA agent to your house every hour on the hour for the next year, how many of those tasks, tests would you pass? All of them. Every, oh. every time, every time you saw it comes, I'm like, do you just want like a direct line? Like, do you want me to just pee in a gallon and just like keep it till you come tomorrow? Like, yeah. so yeah, but I, th I, I think like, like, look, like that's something right there that you could say to anyone. I can, I can be piss and urine tested or sorry, piss and urine. I can be <laughs> piss and blood tested every hour on the hour. If you want all day, every day. And I'll pass every single fucking one of them and I'll well, go to the Olympics. I've said that. What and then what the else argument, can I say? Like what argument, else can be done? You know, and 
I, I don't, it, it is very frustrating. Like I know even having this discussion, we're, I'm going to post this to YouTube and somebody's going to come in here and, and bitch about it and not really watch or understand. And that's, and it's a shame on them, but they're the same people that want to just be entertained. They want to hold the foam finger, say, I love Lasha and just walk out. They don't want to have to think about why they love these people or, or think about the morality of what they do. Yeah. And then every time I've tried to come back with like, oh, here's my public record of my like 75 USADA tests. They're like, anyone with enough money can pay to beat it. I'm like, I don't know how much you think we get paid here. No, and uh, uh, (laughs) you can't. You'll actually, they will laugh at your face if you offer them money. Yeah. uh, And then you will get sanctioned into oblivion. You'll likely, I I think that USA weightlifting would give you probably a lifetime ban, if not eight eight years. Yeah, Ugh. if you tried to bribe an official, there's no question. I think it's probably I th- written in the rules somewhere. Yeah, I think. I mean, we just uh, there's a guy out of the Ukraine who just tried to bribe an official, and he got even more busted, which is hilarious. So so sad to think about a bribe go- gone wrong, right? Like, hey man, I'll give you what you want. Like, you know, <laughs> it's even more They're pathetic. Like, nah. Uh, I want to switch it up just a little bit. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, Vikaya. Is it Vikaya or Vikaya? Vikaya. Vikaya, uh, which is your brand. And I think it's really cool. I think it's really fucking cool. But I, w- I want you to explain kind of your mission around that. So I guess it, it started, I always knew I, I wanted to make an apparel brand, but it was a very broad uh, goal. And so I just didn't do it till I knew what I exactly what I wanted to do because like I don't want to just contribute to this like fitness bitch apparel space like I don't want booty shorts I don't want like bras that are like hoisting your boobs to heaven like I don't I don't like that I don't want that if that's all I can think of to contribute like I'm out um so I waited a solid two years until I was like really narrowed it down into what I felt was missing and that came down to just overarchingly inclusivity like I feel like fitness wear specifically is very tailored to like the CrossFit girl that's like four percent body fat and really skinny and likes to like bounce around and like be barely covered and like for the people that are like real human sized like that is not very comfortable so I wanted to be as inclusive as I can in terms of size shape Whatever you choose to be as a human, like I wanted everyone to feel comfortable just as they are, um, which is like the, the name, the second half, of the name is Kaya and that stands for come as you are because um, that's kind of like our our motto. So we decided to make everything completely genderless um, and every item that we make is made in our full size range from standard, extra, extra small, all the way up to 4X. Um, but we made our own sizes because well, a couple of reasons. One of them is there was no no good size naming system that existed yet that was suitable for male or female sizes. So we had to like kind of combine them. We made a really like interactive situation. But then there's also people that are like, oh, why don't my pants fit me? I know I'm a size small because they're attached to that size. And in their brain, they're like, I don't want to be any bigger than a size small. So then they're constantly buying small, small, small. It doesn't fit. It's uncomfortable. It's falling down. It's see-through. It's whatever. So then we kind of got rid of that. It's like, here are your measurements. This is what you're going to call our size. Find something that fits your body. Don't fit your body into a size. That's – I look, I think if um, – a, as you were telling me this, I'm just thinking that like it's people who want to be comfortable before they go into an uncomfortable situation. And that's getting fitter and that's getting in the gym and that's living a healthier lifestyle. I think that is incredibly admirable because if you look at a lot of things like you're going to have to put yourself in an uncomfortable position to make a change, whether that is, you know, getting more sleep or eating better or going to the gym, it's uncomfortable. But if you have to go to the gym and you get uncomfortable before you even go to the fucking gym, it makes it that much harder. So I think in order to make, you know, if you make people feel okay about the clothes that they're wearing and the comfort level that they have before they go and pursue something, I think that's great. Um, I just had this, I just did this post on Instagram and I just did a video on my YouTube about the New Year's resolutioners. 
and I saw them firsthand at my gym and I was stoked to see them, but I saw their faces. I saw the way that they interacted. They weren't looking at other people in the face. They were, you know, looking towards the ground, but they were going out and taking a step. And to think if they were, if it, it might've been one more thing that was, they were like, you know, I was going to go to the gym, but this experience that I just had was just, I just can't do it. You know, that one thing could have been putting on gym clothes. Right. And then they they're not going to go anymore. So I think it's I I think it's incredibly admirable what what you do. I mean we, I know it's probably not the like most ideal mindset, but we want people to be able to put on whatever, feel feel cute. Like it's not something that's ugly, but then forget what they're wearing. Like it shouldn't be every time I bend over to to take a deadlift, the like waistband rolls under my belly roll, and then that's what I'm thinking about as I'm trying to do this deadlift, or like oh my God, if I stand up, do I have like a massive puddle of butt sweat on my butt that everyone's going to stare at? Like we don't want any of those thoughts happening. We just want you to do what you want to do and just leave it at that. What um, what does your training look like now? I'm pivoting a little bit. What does your <laughs> training look like now and what are your big future plans? Is it just fucking go to the gym and get stronger and then go to Tokyo or not Tokyo, go to Paris? I mean... In a nutshell, yeah. Um, <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> more or less. Um, we took a little bit of a break um, after World, so it was like a little bit lighter. We didn't really go over like 75%, probably just like really drilling technical stuff because um, that's our main focus right now is fixing some not so great habits that reappeared the last like couple of months leading up to Worlds um, and then putting on some some kilos Putting on some kilos. What do you mean by that? Well, because if I have to be an 81, right. it is not advantageous to be 75, 5 and chugging water before weigh-ins. Right. Um, however, so can you can you explain how that works for people? Because like it's just a little bit of a convoluted system again. Yeah. Just a little bit. So they took out classes, weight classes from the Olympics. Um, again, different ones this time. So they took out the one that I was the most comfy in, 76, and it's either 71 or 81. Um, and I was not even, never even considered going down to 71, like been there, done that. We kind of know what my ceiling is in that weight area. Um, but 81 is also, we tried really hard to get up to at least 80 for the last Olympics when I had to weigh 87. And I start to get like achier and slower and just like, overall feel shitty around like 79. So we're hoping to get up to the sweet spot about 78, 78 and a half for this whole quad and then just sit there. That's yeah. I think it's very, uh, it's, it's kind of this old school approach of like getting as heavy as you can and cutting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I love to see how many more athletes are focusing on nutrition and really dialing these things down, uh, so that they don't have to cut make a drastic cut or they don't have to, they're not just slobs because yeah. I think that that absolutely how you feel is how you're going to play. Like, yeah. and you could feel like shit, but you could be the strongest you've ever been. But how repeatable is that? And how long will you be able to do that? It, a lot of it has to do with timing. Right. And I think this is, this is like the coolest thing is like, if you feel good more time, like if you feel good more often, the timing is less important. Right. Cause like yeah. you're likely to just kind of be at this nice level, but if it's kind of like, Hey, today's a great day and it's the day before you compete or, or today's a great day and you're 12 weeks out, like that does nothing for you, you know? Right. So it's, it's nice to be in this kind of place where you can, Oh, you, you'll have a bad day or you'll have a good day, but you'll always be in a dialed spot. And you think 78 is that for you? 78 kilos? Um, I feel the most athletic between 75 and 76, but I have weighed 78 before, like leading up to Tokyo. And that's when it was like the perfect balance of right before I start to get a little bit slower, specifically like in snatches, but also when my strength movements are the strongest. So my squats, my deads, any, any pulling thing, it's definitely like peak strength without slowing down and without my joints being extra achy from just the extra weight. What do you respond to the best in training? Volume. 
and volume. like not not like sixty percent tens, like heavier volume, high intensity. What 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 do you have a working sets? Uh, sorry, like a block in specific. So for me, like what I always love to do is like even when I was at my best at split jerking. One of the best workouts that like got me fired the fuck up was five sets of three or six sets of three at 130 kilos, which was actually really light for jerks. But for some reason, I felt like I could, I could split jerk anything. Do you have a block or like a tra- like a workout that like you love or, or you, maybe you don't love it, but you know, it's, you're getting what you need out of it. Um, we do a lot of repeat single on the minute work for snatches. Well, and we, and we do it for cleans, but for snatches specifically, um, we kind of progress it over a whole cycle. So right now it's not really hard, but as we get towards the end, it's doing like five at 105 on the minute. And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. You don't have to think about it. 105 is above 90%. Like it's a decent percentage. And I mean, that's just an example. We'll do like different, like we'll do three singles here, three here, three here, five here, five here, five here. And we'll do different things, but that being in a above 90% range and on the minute when you don't have time to think about what's going on, be nervous, be scared, be anything, you just go. And if you can get in a groove doing that for me, that's like, I, I don't like it. And I would not say it's my favorite workout, but it's the most beneficial for me. Do you feel like, do you struggle then to slow down and actually have to think? Like, we're like, hey, Maddie, one ten's on here and you got to slow the fuck down and now you got to go attempt. Do you feel um, like... Like, do you change the way that you train then? Because you, because on the minute, essentially at that weight, it's like doing like a slow cluster set. Yeah. So how many reps would you do on the minute? Like how many minutes? Um, Right now we're doing 15 and it's. So 15 reps at what weight? It's at, at in, in different weight ranges. Ah, so it gotcha, won't, gotcha. It'll be like, uh, for example, I think, what was it? Yeah. Yesterday I did 80 something a little bit heavier, a little bit heavier for five singles each. Okay. So it's it's similar to that and it'll get fewer. So we'll do like threes instead of five. So okay. sometimes we'll do okay. a wave up yeah. and then back down. You know, it's, it's fucking wild. Like Lasha does, will literally be seen doing the same thing. Like he'll, and it's kind of essentially like, it's almost like you're doing the same shit, but in a, just tricking your brain. Yeah. Like exactly the first thing you said was like, uh, I don't think as much. I don't have time to think. It's like, that's all mental shit and whatever works, works. Like essentially you could program a double, yeah. right? But what we're doing is it's a double, but you're just taking a minute in between each rep. And yeah. You're continuing and like that for on. me that like almost like countdown when it's like, okay, I have 10 seconds left. Got to stand up and get chalk. And then it's like three, two, one, go. Yeah. Which yep. that sounds crossfitty. I don't, I don't, I don't mean it like that, but like it just not, not that I am like debilitated by my thinking, but if there's going to be one issue, it's generally mental related. Like I'm a very big overthinker or like I overanalyze stuff. Right. So this is just like trust your body, trust your training, think about your one cue and just go. And go. Yeah. It's always the one cue. What, uh, what about nutrition then? Like what is, what is... And I don't want you to give me everything, but like a cursory overview of what you like to do, say in the morning, before training, after training, and before you go to bed. So I feel like I'm a, a more abnormal situation because I don't like eating. I don't. I just. I don't love it. I never have an appetite. Um. So sp- specifically for like two days, I don't like to eat like a big breakfast. I'll just eat like a bagel or something. Mm-hmm. But. Regardless of if it's one session, two sessions, whatever, I drink a lot of my calories while I train. So I'll have a carb, an intra-carb shake of sorts, whether it's like a juice or an actual like carb supplement, um, protein, creatine, and some sort of like salt electrolyte. And so I am drinking the whole time I'm training. I'll have like fucking eight beverages next to me. But that helps me be able to get in the amount of calories that I need every day because like right before, right after training, I don't do well with eating. So it's like, I spend so many hours training. I need to consume something while I'm doing that just to like stay caught up. Okay. Um, what about then? Like, do you do anything before bed or any like after training your relaxing type of shit or is it Um, kind of your standard, like protein, carb, vegetable thing? 
Yeah. I mean, I have my macros that I have to hit just at some point in the day. So it varies. Oh, so you are, um, you're absolutely tracking macros. Oh, yeah. Three, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and I, I personally have to, just to make sure I eat enough. Um, cause if it were up to me, I would just, I would just eat and it'd probably be somewhere around 2000 calories, but I ate 3,800 calories. So that's where you're at. You're 38 and mm-hmm. what, so, so 3,800 calories. What is your protein, fat, carbs? Um, <laughs> so today's a rest day. So I think we're at 3,200. So it's 445 carbs, 85 fat, 170 protein. Okay. Wow. And it's been as high as I remember like when I first, um, for someone who doesn't like eating, that's tough. That's hard. Yeah, it's, it's way harder than any other time when I was cutting weight. That's for sure. Which I like, I never really complain about because it's the opposite for everybody else. So they're like, Shut right. up. you get to eat as much as you want. Yeah. No, but <laughs> if, yeah, if you don't, if it doesn't feel right, I know what you're talking about. I totally understand. You just feel like Bleh, all day. What about um, sleep? Like, do you have any like bedtime? Like what, what is, do you struggle with sleep? Do you, you struggle with sleep? Yes. And I always have, that's just, I think that goes hand in hand with depression um, which is something else that I struggle with. So I very much have insomnia. So I will I will try to set like a be in bed at this time as opposed to like a bedtime because I know it could be, I could fall asleep well that night or it could be a few hours. So I'm like, if I can get myself in bed at this time, like I have a chance. And then since I don't work like a regular nine to five job, the morning hours are usually if I've had a bad night where I couldn't fall asleep or I woke up every 10 minutes, like I'll allow myself to go back to sleep in the morning and try to like make up for that if I have to. Yeah, that's tough. I do. I honestly deal with a very, very similar thing. Uh, I find it really hard to fall asleep, um, but I'm working on it. I'm always, it's like something that I'm training and I have to yeah. train. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, do you try and like practice like certain sleep hygiene to just like at least try and fight it? Like just doing something like this was the funniest shit ever. Like I remember I was in a really bad spot. I was so anxious and dealing with so much shit that I had gotten um, shingles. I broke out in shingles, which is crazy. And a lot of the reason behind that is anxiety. And I went to the emergency room and I'm like, look, I haven't slept in like... I don't know, 48 hours. Like I'm not sleeping at all. If I do sleep, it's like a miracle. And it happened like the best hours of sleep for me are between like 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. Yeah. Like it sucks um, when everyone's like, oh, I'm like dead asleep by midnight. I'm like, wow, couldn't be me. Could you not. know, <laughs> so so I said that to the doctor. And I'm like, please, like I would love some sleep meds. And she said to me, I shit you not, have you ever tried melatonin? And I was just like, oh God, like you think melatonin is going to solve this? Oh, my sweet summer child. Sorry. I didn't say that to my, to my, to an actual PhD, but I, I understand the difficulty with sleep a lot. That's why I I always ask, I I want to always ask people what their sleep hygiene is and if they work on it. I mean, I tried to be like the person that's like, no phone at this time, lights off at this time, don't look at any sort of screen. And it's like nothing, nothing helped anything. I mean, I have like the calm with melatonin. I'll drink it before bed. My husband falls asleep in like four seconds from it. And I'm just like. It's always the significant others who can sleep so fucking well. I have to like wake him up and be like, babe, turn off your iPad. You fell asleep. And I'm like nowhere near even closing one eye yet. (sighs) <sighs> but I will say what has helped me more than anything else is making sure I'm not hot because if I'm hot, no, 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 nothing's happening. So I have a like cooling pillowcase, cooling sheets. I have a, a, I think it's called an Uller now, but I have a chili pad that like goes under your sheets and circulates cool water all night. Whoa. Like, okay. sleep so- noises. I cannot fall asleep without an ocean sound or a white noise. Like I have like a whole fucking setup and the room has to be pitch black. Yeah. Right. And so like when I travel, I have like a, an eye mask and earplugs 
Mm-hmm. And like, oh, you're fine. You got see these are things. Those are those are pretty good. Those are really good. Do you? And then do, I, I like, I don't know. I just feel like if you're someone who really like struggles with sleep, you just know that it's there's no like there's no solution. Like people who don't understand, they're like, just read before bed. You'll fall asleep so much I know. better. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna read until four a.m. Is what I'm gonna do. Yeah, take take melatonin, read, uh, meditate, breathe, listen to this, do this. It's like. I know it's very, very frustrating one, but I still, I still try. Yeah, <laughs> I try. I, I, I still, like put my phone away and I'm like, yeah. I'm going to read my book. I'm going to yeah. put my ocean sounds on. Yeah. Uh, okay, Maddie, I think we'll, we'll end it there because uh, I got training, sleep, <laughs> and nutrition out of you. I don't Cut know if all. you realize that. I really appreciate you being on. Uh, I think I'll probably see you next in person at the Arnold, correct? Are you going to be at the Arnold or are you not going to I don't know be- yet. You don't know. Well, I guess it's ranking. different. I guess it's different. It's like you're if you're going to Worlds, if you're planning on hitting the quad, it's different to qualify for things. Like you don't just go where all the weightlifters go. Yeah, we're waiting to see whatever updated ranking. And if I'm in a safe spot on it, I'm not going to go. Because we have Pan Ams like three weeks later. Oh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, but I appreciate you coming on. Um, if do, Would you like to plug your stuff? Uh... Where can people find you? On Instagram. Um, I am no longer Maddie Cakes with five S's. Thank God. It's now Maddie Rogers Oli. Um, I have a Twitter. And <laughs> and uh, your, your uh, apparel brand. Oh, Not yes. Not apparel, and but it's like. I, yes, I own my apparel company, Vikaya. Um, We're extra small business, so any amount of purchasing helps us a lot. Well, Maddie, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I will hopefully get you back on not too long from now. Sounds good to me.